The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 21. The Lion Becomes the King of Beasts. After climbing down from the China Wall, the travelers found themselves in a disagreeable country, full of bogs and marshes and covered with tall, rank grass. It was difficult to walk without falling into muddy holes, for the grass was so thick that it hid them from sight. However, by carefully picking their way, they got safely along until they reached solid ground. But here the country seemed wilder than ever, and after a long and tiresome walk through the underbrush, they entered another forest, where the trees were bigger and older than any they had ever seen. This forest is perfectly delightful, declared the lion, looking around him with joy. I have never seen a more beautiful place. It seems gloomy, said the scarecrow. Not a bit of it, answered the lion. I should like to live here all my life. See how soft the dry leaves are under your feet, and how rich and green the moss is that clings to these old trees. Surely no wild beast could wish a pleasanter home. Perhaps there are wild beasts in the forest now, said Dorothy. I suppose there are, returned the lion, but I do not see any of them about. They walked through the forest until it became too dark to go any farther. Dorothy and Toto and the lion lay down to sleep, while the woodman and the scarecrow kept watch over them as usual. When morning came, they started again. Before they had gone far, they heard a low rumble, as of the growling of many wild animals. Toto whimpered a little, but none of the others was frightened, and they kept along the well-trodden path until they came to an opening in the wood in which were gathered hundreds of beasts of every variety. There were tigers and elephants and bears and wolves and foxes and all the others in the natural history, and for a moment Dorothy was afraid. But the lion explained that the animals were holding a meeting, and he judged by their snarling and growling that they were in great trouble. As he spoke, several of the beasts caught sight of him, and at once the great assemblage hushed as if by magic. The biggest of the tigers came up to the lion and bowed, saying, Welcome, O king of beasts. You have come in good time to fight our enemy and bring peace to all the animals of the forest once more. What is your trouble? answered the lion quietly we are all threatened answered the tiger by a fierce enemy which has lately come into this forest it is a most tremendous monster like a great spider with a body as big as an elephant and legs as long as a tree trunk it has eight of these long legs and as the monster crawls through the forest he seizes an animal with a leg and drags it to his mouth where he eats it as a spider does a fly none of us is safe while this fierce creature is alive and we had called a meeting to decide how to take care of it ourselves when you came along the lion thought for a moment are there any other lions in this forest he asked no there were some but the monster has eaten them all and besides they were none of them nearly so large and brave as you if i put an end to your enemy will you bow down to me and obey me as the king of the forest inquired the lion we will do that gladly returned the tiger and all the other beasts roared with a mighty roar we will where is this great spider of yours now asked the lion yonder among the oak trees said the tiger pointing with his forefoot take good care of these friends of mine said the lion and i will go at once to fight the monster he bade his comrades good-bye and marched proudly away to do battle with the enemy the great spider was lying asleep when the lion found him and it looked so ugly that its foe turned up his nose in disgust its legs were quite as long as the tiger had said and its body covered with coarse black hair it had a great mouth with a row of sharp teeth a foot long but its head was joined to the pudgy body by a neck as slender as a wasp's waist this gave the lion a hint of the best way to attack the creature and as he knew it was easier to fight it asleep than awake he gave a great spring and landed directly upon the monster's back then with one blow of his heavy paw all armed with sharp claws he knocked the spider's head from its body jumping down he watched it until the long legs stopped wiggling when he knew it was quite dead the lion went back to the opening where the beasts of the forest were waiting for him and said proudly you need fear your enemy no longer then the beasts bowed down to the lion as their king and he promised to come back and rule over them as soon as dorothy was safely on her way to kansas chapter twenty two the country of the quadlings the four travelers passed through the rest of the forest in safety and when they came out from its gloom saw before them a steep hill covered from top to bottom with great pieces of rock that will be a hard climb said the scarecrow but we must get over the hill nevertheless so he led the way and the others followed they had nearly reached the first rock when they heard a rough voice cry out keep back who are you asked the scarecrow then a head showed itself over the rock and the same voice said this hill belongs to us and we don't allow anyone to cross it but we must cross it said the scarecrow we're going to the country of the quadlings but you shall not replied the voice and there stepped from behind the rock the strangest man the travelers had ever seen he was quite short and stout and had a big head which was flat at the top and supported by a thick neck full of wrinkles but he had no arms at all and seeing this the scarecrow did not fear that so helpless a creature could prevent them from climbing the hill so he said i'm sorry not to do as you wish but we must pass over the hill whether you like it or not and he walked boldly forward as quick as lightning the man's head shot forward and his neck stretched out until the top of his head where it was flat struck the scarecrow in the middle and sent him tumbling over and over down the hill almost as quickly as it had came the head went back to the body and the man laughed harshly as he said it isn't as easy as you think a chorus of boisterous laughter came from the other rocks and dorothy saw hundreds of the armless hammer heads upon the hillside one behind every rock 
The lion became quite angry at the laughter caused by the scarecrow's mishap, and giving a loud roar that echoed like thunder, he dashed up the hill. Again a head shot swiftly out, and the great lion went rolling down the hill as if he had been struck by a cannonball. Dorothy ran down and helped the scarecrow to his feet, and the lion came up to her, feeling rather bruised and sore, and said, It is useless to fight people with shooting heads. No one can withstand them. What can we do then? she asked. Call the winged monkeys, suggested the tin woodman. You still have the right to command them once more. Very well, she answered, and putting on the golden cap, she uttered the magic words. The monkeys were as prompt as ever, and in a few moments the entire band stood before her. What are your commands? inquired the king of the monkeys, bowing low. Carry us over the hill to the country of the quadlings, answered the girl. It shall be done, said the king, and at once the winged monkeys caught the four travelers in total up in their arms and flew away with them. As they passed over the hill, the hammerheads yelled with vexation and shot their heads high in the air, but they could not reach the winged monkeys, which carried Dorothy and her comrades safely over the hill and set them down in the beautiful country of the quadlings. This is the last time you can summon us, said the leader to Dorothy, so goodbye and good luck to you. Goodbye and thank you very much, returned the girl, and the monkeys rose into the air and were out of sight in a twinkling. The country of the quadlings seemed rich and happy. There was field upon field of ripening grain, with well-paved roads running between them, and pretty rippling brooks with strong bridges across them. The fences and houses and bridges were all painted bright red, just as they had been painted yellow in the country of the Winkies, and blue in the country of the Munchkins. The quadlings themselves, who were short and fat and looked chubby and good-natured, were dressed all in red, which showed bright against the green grass and the yellowing grain. The monkeys had set them down near a farmhouse, and the four travelers walked up to it and knocked at the door. It was opened by the farmer's wife, and when Dorothy asked for something to eat, the woman gave them all a good dinner, with three kinds of cake and four kinds of cookies, and a bowl of milk for Toto. How far is it to the castle of Glinda? asked the child. It is not a great way, answered the farmer's wife. Take the road to the south, and you will soon reach it. Thanking the good woman, they started afresh and walked by the fields and across the pretty bridges until they saw before them a very beautiful castle. Before the gates were three young girls, dressed in handsome red uniforms, trimmed with gold braid, and as Dorothy approached, one of them said to her, why have you come to the south country to see the good witch who rules here she answered will you take me to her let me have your name and i will ask glinda if she will receive you they told who they were and the girl soldier went into the castle after a few moments she came back to say that dorothy and the others were to be admitted at once chapter twenty three glinda the good witch grants dorothy's wish before they went to see glinda however they were taken to a room of the castle where dorothy washed her face and combed her hair and the lion shook the dust out of his mane and the scarecrow patted himself into his best shape and the tin woodman polished his tin and oiled his joints. When they were all quite presentable, they followed the soldier girl into a big room where the witch Glinda sat upon a throne of rubies. She was both beautiful and young to their eyes. Her hair was a rich red in color and fell in flowing ringlets over her shoulders. Her dress was pure white, but her eyes were blue, and they looked kindly upon the little girl. What can I do for you, my child? she said. Dorothy told the witch all her story, how the cyclone had brought her to the land of Oz, how she found her companions, and of the wonderful adventures they had met with. My greatest wish now, she added, is to get back to Kansas, for Aunt Em will surely think something dreadful has happened to me, and that will make her put on mourning, and unless the crops are better this year than they were last, I am sure Uncle Henry cannot afford it. Glinda leaned forward and kissed the sweet, upturned face of the loving little girl. Bless your dear heart, she said. I am sure I can tell you of a way to get back to Kansas. Then she added, But if I do, you must give me the golden cap. Willingly, exclaimed Dorothy. Indeed, it is of no use to me now and when you have it you can command the winged monkeys three times and i think i shall need their service just those three times answered glinda smiling dorothy then gave her the golden cap and the witch said to the scarecrow what will you do when dorothy has left of us i will return to the emerald city he replied for oz has made me its ruler and the people like me the only thing that worries me is how to cross the hill of the hammerheads by means of the golden cap i shall command the winged monkeys to carry you to the gates of the emerald city said glinda for it would be a shame to deprive the people of so wonderful a ruler am i really wonderful asked the scarecrow you are unusual replied glinda turning to the tin woodman she asked what will become of you when dorothy leaves this country he leaned on his axe and thought a moment then he said the winkies were very kind to me and wanted me to rule over them after the wicked witch died i am fond of the winkies and if i could get back again to the country of the west i should like nothing better than to rule over them forever my second command to the winged monkeys said glinda will be that they carry you safely to the land of the winkies your brain may not be so large to look at as those of the scarecrow but you are really brighter than he is, when you are well polished, and I am sure you will rule the Winkies wisely and well. Then the witch looked at the big shaggy lion and asked, When Dorothy has returned to her home, what will become of you? Over the hill of the Hammerheads, he answered, lies a grand old forest, and all the beasts that live there have made me their king. If I could only get back to this forest, I would pass my life very happily there. My third command to the winged monkeys, said Glinda, shall be to carry you to your forest. 
Then, having used up the powers of the golden cap, I shall give it to the king of the monkeys that he and his bond may thereafter be free for evermore. The scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion now thanked the good witch earnestly for her kindness, and Dorothy exclaimed, You are certainly as good as you are beautiful, but you have not yet told me how to get back to Kansas. Your silver shoes will carry you over the desert, replied Linda. If you had known their power, you could have gone back to your Aunt Em the very first day you came to this country. But then I should not have my wonderful brains, cried the scarecrow. I might have passed my whole life in the farmer's cornfield. And I should not have had my lovely heart, said the tin woodman. I might have stood and rested in the forest till the end of the world. And I should have lived a coward forever, declared the lion. And no beast in all the forest would have had a good word to say to me. This is all true, said Dorothy. And I am glad I was of use to these good friends. But now that each of them has what he desired most, and each is happy in having a kingdom to rule besides, I think I should like to go back to Kansas. The silver shoes, said the good witch, have wonderful powers, and one of the most curious things about them is that can, they can carry you to any place in the world in three steps, and each step will be made in the wink of an eye. All you have to do is knock the heels together three times and command the shoes to carry you wherever you wish to go. If that is so, said the child joyfully, I will ask them to carry me back to Kansas at once. She threw her arms around the lion's neck and kissed him, patting his big head tenderly. Then she kissed the tin woodman, who was weeping in a way most dangerous to his joints. But she hugged the soft, stuffed body of the scarecrow in her arms instead of kissing his painted face, and found she was crying herself at the sorrowful parting from her loving comrades. Glinda the Good stepped down from her ruby throne to give the little girl a goodbye kiss, and Dorothy thanked her for all the kindness she had shown to her friends and herself. Dorothy now took up Toto solemnly in her arms, and having said one last goodbye, she clapped the heels of her shoes together three times, saying, Take me home to Aunt Em. Instantly she was whirling through the air, so swiftly that all she could see or feel was the wind whistling past her ears. The silver shoes took but three steps, and then she stopped so suddenly that she rolled over upon the grass several times before she knew where she was. At length, however, she sat up and looked about her. Good gracious, she cried, for she was sitting on the broad Kansas prairie, and just before her was the new farmhouse Uncle Henry built after the cyclone carried away the old one. Uncle Henry was milking cows in the barnyard, and Toto had jumped out of her arms and was running toward the barn, barking furiously. Dorothy stood up and found she was in her stocking feet, for the silver shoes had fallen off in her flight through the air and were lost forever in the desert. Chapter 24 Home Again Aunt Em had just come out of the house to water the cabbages when she looked up and saw Dorothy running toward her. My darling child, she cried, folding the little girl in her arms and covering her face with kisses. Where in the world did you come from? From the land of Oz, said Dorothy gravely. And here is Toto, too. And oh, Aunt Em, I'm so glad to be at home again. End of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum